As we were coming to Cape Town from Virunga, we, you know, we were discussing Julie, my director of, of tourism development, and I, the um, how how really how we should pitch it, um, and that was a it was a difficult one, um, and really what we decided was that it really shouldn't be a sanitised version of what um, what we've lived through in Virunga, um, and. Um, you know, in spite of the fact that you, you are here as um, uh, travel professionals and, you know, we really should be selling ourselves to you, um, I don't, you know, we would prefer to run the risk of you going home thinking, you know, do I want to go to Virunga? Hell no, I'd rather live. Um, and the, um, <laughs> you know, that, that is a reality that we live with. But at the same time, Virunga has seen uh, the development of quite a remarkable thing um, with the development of tourism over the last few years. Um, Eastern Congo has gone through um, an appalling period of violence and armed conflict. Uh, it's generally regarded as the most uh, violent tragedy in human history since the Second World War. Six million Congolese people, six million innocent civilians have died in Eastern Congo since the beginning of the war in, in 1996. Um, and of course, that is the, the running theme throughout our journey, throughout our story in Virunga. Um, and really what I would prefer you to go home feeling is just how important your role as tourism practitioners, um, as travel professionals is in regions like that. And I think there are probably few people places on earth um, where the work that you do can play such an important role in bringing, bringing about change. Um, for my part, I came to um, Eastern Congo 23 years ago. Um, I was very privileged to have been um, brought up, to have grown up in, in East Africa. And like so many people um, of, of my age in that part of the world, national parks were everything. Wildlife was what we loved more than anything. And of course, that's, that's where I wanted to, um, that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, and Congo in particular had this sort of mythical uh, feel about it. And, and in particular, this, this magical place in the center of Africa that had some of the highest mountains and that had this incredible abundance of some of the most amazing wildlife on the continent. And particularly these mountains and these volcanoes, these active volcanoes with these forests around them that were the home of the mountain gorillas. Um, and so when I first came to Congo, um, it was with very limited funding. I bought a motorbike um, in Uganda and, and, and drove across Uganda and then across the escarpment, the western um, rift valley, um, and then down into this incredible landscape that was uh, Virunga. And of course, what I saw there was everything I could possibly hope for. Um, from the, the, the ruined Zoris, the, the mythical mountains of the moon that, that stretch up to the, the glaciers on the summit at over 17,000 feet. Um, and then you go down through the moraine and through the, the moorlands into the alpine forests and then down into the lowland tropical moist forests of the Aturi, some of the greatest untouched um, forest massifs left on earth um, with these incredible species, the Akapi, um, over, over 20 species of, of primates and so on. And then you move south through Virunga, um, down up, up the Semeliki Valley, um, across the wetlands and, and, and the Great Lakes of, of Central Africa, um, into the savannas, um, and then up into the mountains again, which are, of course, the, the Virunga Massif. Um, and there you, you come from these great altitudes of the, of the Rinzoris to a place where you can, you, you can really see right into the center of the earth um, with the, the largest lava lake on earth um, at the center of this amazing crater, which is um, Mount Niragongo. Um, and then around those, um, those uh, volcanoes, you've got uh, the, these alpine forests, which, which, um, which are home to um, this incredible, fragile, incredibly fragile species, which is, the, of course, the, the mountain gorilla, which is emblematic of the incredible diversity of wildlife that you'll find in Virunga, 
the park that contains within it the greatest number of mammals, reptiles, and birds on Earth for a, for a protected area. Um, and so um, it is this magical place that brought me to Virunga um, 20, 23, to, to Eastern Congo 23 years ago. Um, but while, um, you know, while it was the wildlife that brought me there, what really kept me in Virunga for all that time were the people that I met, and in particular, this very unique, very, um, very unusual, um, very remarkable team of rangers, um, which were um, the staff of Virunga National Park. And when I arrived, it was very much like this. Um, they'd have essentially been abandoned by the rest of the world. Um, it, the war had been um, happening for a, for a few years, um, and they were really the last government um, um, officials to have stayed behind after the first Congolese civil war, which started in 1996. And the army had fled, uh, many of the public servants, many of the state officials, the, the infrastructure of the state had collapsed, um, but there was this one team that stayed as national park staff. Um, and because of that, they had paid a huge price. Um, for one thing, they hadn't been paid. Um, they were no longer receiving their salaries, um, but they had stayed on. And I've, I've often thought about, you know, what could possibly be the reasons for that. And certainly one of them is the great tradition that exists in Congo for wildlife conservation. Um, and, you know, the, the, the fact that many of them their parents were rangers, their grandparents were rangers, and they were continuing in this, in this tradition. Um, but um, other than the fact that they were no longer supported, they no longer had their uniforms, many of them weren't even wearing shoes, and they certainly didn't have the essential equipment to be able to do their jobs. Um, and because of that, um, they'd suffered a huge price. Um, there is no park on earth where the sacrifice has been greater on the part of its rangers as Virunga over the period of armed conflict that we, we've suffered in Eastern Congo, 154 of the 400 rangers have, have died. Um, and so um, it's a simple um, fact that when you choose to become a ranger in, in Virunga, um, your chances of suffering a violent death as part of your work is between 30 and 40%. And there is no, there is no military force on earth that suffers that level of fatality. Um, um, and yet, what is... Um, what is unusual is the continuity of it all, the commitment on, on their part. And that's really what's, what's carried me through. Um, but at the same time, um, it's this real drive to try and understand what the fundamental issues are. Um, and one of them, of course, was captured by this photo that was taken by a very, a very close friend. Um, and it's always been very disturbing for me, not least because these amazing, amazing rangers who, um, who I, I, over the years, became, have become increasingly attached to, are reflected in this picture as um, a force that are kind of defending the impossible, um, defending the undefendable. Um, and what, what you see in this picture are a group of women who are desperately trying to get access to the park and one of our rangers, one of our staff, um, preventing them from coming in. And it's a, um, it's, it's a, a deeply disturbing image um, that I've tried to understand for a long time. And really what it comes down to, and it's a problem that affects conservation throughout Africa, um, is that we're living with um, this, this concept that's increasingly coming to light, which is this idea of environmental injustice. Um, and what we have, and it's, it's a very simple mathematical formula, is we have about two million acres of land in Virunga. This is some of the most fertile land on the African continent. Um, and um, around that, you have about four million people. And those, those four million people live within a day's walk of the park boundary. And those numbers are increasing. It's a, it's a catastrophe. Um, but it's also an enormous problem because that land within the park's boundaries um, represents about $600 of revenue for um, a, a, a farming family in eastern Congo per year. That's um, $15, rather, of net profit a year. It's a huge amount of money for a Congolese family. Um, 
and um, um, at the same time you have a national park that is also a World Heritage Site. And what that signifies is that it's a piece of land, it's a, it's a, it's a property on the surface of the earth that is there for the whole of humanity and that is there because it's so important in terms of its biological value that it has to have this special status um, and what it represents is that it's something that's benefiting um, the, the, the whole of humanity. Um, and, and of course it has huge value at that level but it also has a cost and that cost is, all, is being borne almost entirely by the local population. Um, a local population that's made up of people who are amongst the poorest on earth. Um, if, you, um, if you work that out, $600 of net profit per year um, times 2 million acres of land, you're talking about over a billion dollars of revenue for some of the poorest people on earth that is being forfeited so that the rest of us can enjoy Virunga's amazing wildlife. So we have a, a huge problem there, a huge problem that needs to be overcome. Um, and what so often happens when you have high levels of injustice is that you get violence. Um, and of course, it's this issue of resources um, that um, affects us so badly in Virunga, of how resources, who gets access to resources, um, and the, the justice issues that relate to that, um, that, that, that affect the political situation in Eastern Congo, as it does in so many other places in Africa and across the world. Um, and so, um, of course, there are other consequences as well. The situation is untenable, um, and it spreads, it affects everything. Um, and that's one of the, 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 the many, you know, the fundamental reason why we're suddenly found with a, a, a crisis in conservation that we can't manage as conservationists. And that's really one of the running themes, is that I, I, would, I would like to consider myself as a conservationist, and in doing so, I come to realize just how inadequate we are as a profession. We just can't confront these overwhelming issues. And that's really why I'm here today, is because we need people like yourselves, people who in many ways live in the real world um, and are addressing um, the bigger issues that affect the lives of people on this continent. Um, and, um, you know, whilst, you know, we saw in um, that, that earlier photo was taken in 2007 at the height of the guerrilla killings, inherently tied to um, this resource problem in eastern Congo, people's need to access the forest, in this case for charcoal, um, began killing the gorillas because in killing the gorillas it would prevent the rangers from protecting the forest and that would enable them to access that forest for charcoal, an industry that is worth about $35 million a year. You know, these are big sums of money. And the same extends, of course, to all the other species in Virunga um, over a period of um, 40 years. Um, like in the rest of Africa, we've seen this catastrophic depletion of wildlife. You know, we're in real trouble in conservation. Um, and Virunga is just a reflection of what's happening everywhere else. Um, and so we had to confront this. And, and really the, the, the huge advantage that I had um, when I was nominated as, um, as park warden for Virunga were the people I was able to um, lean on for um, support in trying to carve out a, a strategy that would help us to confront these overwhelming challenges that Virunga was facing. Um, and no one more than my, my three wardens. So Virunga's a, a big park. It's about 300 kilometers north to south. And of course, it's unmanageable from the center. And so it's divided into three sectors. And each sector has a warden. It's a bit like a national park in itself. Um, and this was them. On, on, on the left is Innocent Buranumwe, who's my deputy. He's responsible for the southern sector. I think there is no one on earth that has a better knowledge of the mountain gorillas than him. He's an absolute expert. Um, he, 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 he doesn't have a formal education, but he has a deeper knowledge of gorilla ecology and behavior than any PhD you could find anywhere. Um, and his, his father was a, a ranger, his grandfather was a ranger. His brother uh, became a ranger like him. He lost his brother during the war and he continued the fight and came up through the ranks to become a senior warden. Um, 
another of my deputies is Rodrigue Muguruka, who, um, who um, you saw in that short preview. He was the one, he was the central character in this film that was produced two years ago. Um, and um, he was the central character because he really spearheaded the investigation into this oil company that was illegally exploring for oil in Virunga National Park. Oil, of course, is one of those resources that cannot be exploited in a national park. It becomes illegal. And as you'll find in nearly every analysis that's been done in Eastern Congo, it's the illegal exploitation of natural resources that is the fundamental cause of civil war. It's what has provoked the death of six million people. It's an extremely serious issue. And it's not just about protecting a national park. It's about addressing the, the, the fundamental issues to do with the rule of law, upholding the rule of law, um, maintaining the authority of the state so that there is stability, so that there is peace. Um, and these are really the issues that he was confronting. Um, and what it cost him was to be illegally detained. He was arrested. Um, he was detained for 17 days, and during those 17 days, very brutally tortured. Because of that, we had to get him out, um, and, and he's now serving as a senior park warden in another park on the other side of Congo. Um, but it meant that I lost one of my most talented um, wardens for, for Virunga. Um, the, 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 the third uh, member of my staff was Atama, who... Um, I first met the day I arrived in Congo. He was just a ranger. I then spent several years with him um, in, in the park. Um, and he taught me a lot of what I had learned about um, working and living in a national park. I was, very, I was very naive when I first arrived. And he really got me through those, those initial steps. Um, and he, like the other two, um, worked their way through the ranks um, to become uh, a senior warden. Um, as he was returning to um, the park station uh, three years ago, um, he, he was ambushed by a militia. He was shot in the back, and he, he died two days later. And really, the, um, you know, the, the, the reason I, I come back on these, you know, these terrible events that, that, have, that have affected us is just to, um, to explain to you just how fragile these, these systems are. You know, these are remarkable people. They're incredibly strong human beings, um, but they're hanging on a thread. Um, and so the first real confrontation that we had, um, you know, when, when I was first nominated as a, as a, as a park director, um, two weeks later, um, there was a, 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 um, a, a war that started. This was the first CNDP war. And of course, like so many of these wars, in fact, Every war that's, that's happened in eastern Congo has started either inside or immediately around Virunga National Park. It's on the border between Rwanda, Uganda, and Congo, three countries that have been in, in, um, at war with each other over the last few years. And unfortunately for, for Virunga, it, just, it sits in the middle of that. Um, and the first real issue we had to confront was how to, um, how to tackle the politics. Um, and there we relied heavily on this status of, of Virunga as a World Heritage Site, which means that it's governed by international conventions. And we were able to argue with the Congolese government, um, for whom we, we work as, as public servants, um, that the, an international convention, so Congo's commitment um, to, to this convention, put its, put, put, puts conservation above the political problems of the day. Um, and, and, and with that discussion, um, with that negotiation with the central government in Kinshasa, we were able to secure their agreement that we, as the only government officials, were able to open discussions with the rebels. Um, this was the CNDP movement. It was a large-scale rebellion that almost took, took, down, took the whole country to its knees in 2007, 2008. Um, and they allowed us to cross the front line um, and to request a meeting with their leader, um, General Nkunda, um, who's in this picture, and, and to discuss the issue of the country's heritage, um, of the importance of protecting that heritage for the future, given the significance of um, the tourism, 
future tourism industry. Um, and um, amazingly, it was accepted by both sides. And so suddenly we had this agreement that whatever happens as conservationists, we would continue our work. And it's a principle um, that, that came from that period in 2007, 2008, and we've managed to uphold ever since. Um, and it's for the simple fact that a, um, a protected area, a national park, um, when it's been depleted, when it's been terribly damaged, can take 20 or 30 years to rebuild. And we're in the process of doing that, but it can be destroyed in three days. And so you can never leave a national park once you've decided to try and rebuild it. You have to maintain that effort no matter what. Um, and that's one of the very remarkable things about Congo, is that at a political level, that has been accepted as a, as a fundamental principle. Um, but of course, it's not about um, politics alone. Um, more than that, it's about economics and it's about um, the population that lives around the park. Um, and really that's where you know, the, 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 the question of how does tourism fit into that. Um, of course, during periods of armed conflict, um, it's impossible to do tourism and you suspend it. Um, but there are also long periods in which um, there is peace, um, there is relative peace, but more importantly, there's an incredibly committed team of Congolese professionals who are able to manage insecurity. And during those periods, it's possible to bring visitors safely. And we've had over 5,000 visitors come to Virunga um, without a single incident. Um, it is possible to manage tourism safely. And that really is the big breakthrough for a place like Virunga, not just for the national park, but for the whole region. And I don't think... I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if everyone really understands just how important their work is in this room in terms of regions like Eastern Congo, where the greatest handicap is the isolation that we live in. You really are the breakthrough in terms of overcoming that hurdle and enabling peace to, to return to a place like, um, like Eastern Congo. Um, but for that, you really need to understand the dynamics of conflict. You really need to understand exactly what's going on. And for the sake of six million people who've died, who should not have died in that way, we really have a responsibility to try and understand what's going on. And it's all tied to natural resources. You know, we've got um, these biological resources, the forests, the fish in the lake, um, and of course the mineral resources that lie underneath, um, that when they're exploited legally and under a... a, a, a a good system of governance, bring incredible wealth to that region. But when they're not, it's quite the opposite. It brings enormous tragedy, enormous suffering to that region. And as um, um, caretakers of that region, as those who are responsible and who are mandated to uphold the law with reference to those natural resources, park rangers really are on the front line, hence um, the incredible rate of fatalities that, they, that they've, they've come under. Um, they are the ones who are fighting that fight. Um, and, um, and so what, what we needed was a model that would help us to overcome those problems. And of course, what we immediately realized is that as conservationists, we're just too weak to be able to do so. You know, we just don't have the strength um, to be able to tackle these enormous political and economic issues that are surrounding the national park. And so what you do in a situation like that is you make friends. You build alliances, you build partnerships, um, and really it's all about that. And it's through that that this concept of a Virunga alliance that ties us in with the three segments of organized society, the, the kind of societies that you're used to, where governments, public servants really deliver to the population as they should, as their responsibilities um, um, require them to do. Um, and really that's um, you know, building alliances with public institutions, of course, government institutions, but also with civil society, um, and it's extremely vibrant in Eastern Congo, um, but also the private sector, um, starting with um, those industries that are prepared to, to look into Eastern Congo, and, to, and, and, and the travel industry is, is one of those. Um, but focusing on certain values, and those values are tied to good governance, transparency in government. Um, they're tied to... Um, the issue of sustainability, 
you know, not damaging the environment, um, but also protecting for the long term um, the institutions that work there. Um, and then thirdly, of course, it's looking at um, those, those segments of society that are the poorest and most vulnerable um, and upholding their interests, because ultimately that's what enables us to, to move forward. Um, and, um, and out of that came a model that starts with um, the National Park, um, but looks first of all at um, the, um, you know, that tradition um, in, in all national parks in terms of economic development, which is tourism. Um, and so the first real drive was to um, reform the institution um, and um, 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 build a tourism industry around it that also helps to make um, the government institution, which is the National, Sp National Park Service, more sustainable. Around that, start to look at those critical, that critical infrastructure that enables us to rebuild the country, um, rebuild the area um, around Virunga. Um, and I'll focus just in a, in a, in a minute more on the, on, on, on the whole issue of energy, because that, that's key. Um, and then thirdly, really working with the private sector at a local level and the higher, higher level to try and generate income on a large scale, the critical mass of economic resources um, through the formal sector, a sector that's actually paying its taxes so that government institutions can, um, can, can sustain themselves, um, and, and rebuilding that economy as a prerequisite for peace. Um, it's very simple. There's 70% unemployment in Eastern Congo. When there's 70% unemployment, it's no surprise that people look towards violence, they look towards taking up arms as a way of, of scratching a living. Um, and that's why so many young men end up in the, in the armed militias in Eastern Congo. Um, and so, but to be able to do that, you need the resources. Um, and you don't want to be exploiting resources that are either illegal or enormously damaging to society or to the environment. Um, but those resources exist, you know, and what we've got is energy not oil under the National Park, which is enormously destructive um, and damaging, um, but um, sustainable energy. It's a high, high, um, high rainfall area um, with, with these very high mountains. The rivers flowing out of them are high in energy, and that can be converted to electricity that's consumed locally. Um, the fisheries, you know, when a proper system of governments is brought about, then it becomes a 40, $45 million a year industry. Um, Likewise, of course, for, um, for agriculture. And then, of course, this, this industry, which is tourism, um, which is critically important, not just because um, it's, it's, um, um, it's bringing tourist dollars to the region. That's a very minor part of the issue. Um, really, it's a very minor part of the, the benefit that tourism brings to Eastern Congo. It's much more um, bringing exposure to the region um, breaking away its isolation, um, which is a, a, a feature that, 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 that has played a key role in, in, in the violence that we've lived through. And of course, the first step um, is to reform the institution, to build a cadre of rangers who are able to provide security um, to those visitors, but also to the population um, living around the park. Um, and that's been a, a big process that's taken about 10 years. Um, and um, has led to the professionalization of, of Virunga's staff. Um, and around that, uh, the creation of a new industry um, and, and, and this, this tourism industry that's now growing um, that you know, brings these in incredible products to, to, to the world, including, of course, the mountain gorillas, but these, these amazing volcanoes, um, and probably 30 or 40 different products in, in one single national park. Um, but Again, um, you know, just to, to really emphasize that point about what, what tourism has brought to us, um, it's the notion that things can happen um, in Virunga, that people can come safely, and if they can come safely to visit, they can also come safely to invest and to develop um, industries that are, um, um, that are secure. Um, and the most important of those, of course, is energy, which really is at the basis of um, uh, a, a local industry. Um, without energy, it, um, enterprise cannot happen. 
Um, and what we found is that for every megawatt of electricity that we've generated on a program that started in 2010, you can create between 800 and 1,000 jobs. Virunga can create 100 megawatts of energy, um, and we're well underway in creating that industry with a, a network of hydroelectric plants around the park. It's a $200 million pro program of which 100 million has already been secured. Without that, um, um, enterprise can't happen. We can't drive down unemployment. Um, and by driving down unemployment, we have one of the greatest hopes for, for peace in the region. That only happened because of the tourism infrastructure. Um, and so um, what we find is alongside that, you know, finally, the conservation um, benefits, the conservation outcomes that we're looking for, you know, the mountain gorillas that, that now represent one of the greatest successes in modern conservation, a population that when I started, when I was, um, when I was a teenager, my parents described to me as a species that I would never see when I grew up. Um, it's actually a species that has now doubled in size since that period. Um, and so we... We, 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 have, we really have every reason to be optimistic. We have every reason um, to keep working, to keep driving um, these amazing um, wilderness areas that Africa is so, so fortunate to have. Um, but of course, you know, we really should never forget those who've sacrificed everything um, to make that happen. Um, but thank, thank you very much, and, and if I can wish you. Thank you.